Well, hello everyone, this is John Byrne. And guess what? We're gonna turn the tables. We're gonna have a former member of the Harvard Business School Admissions Committee grill me in a mock interview. Let me introduce you to someone you should already know. We've done a number of YouTube videos with her. Devi Vallabhaney, who is with MBA Mission and is very busy these days doing lots of mock interviews for uh, Harvard MBA applicants who've been invited to interview. The interview started yesterday, but that's of no care to us really because I think we're going to produce something that is hardly perishable, but timeless. Now, Debbie's going to put on her mask her poker face mask, and going to grill me in a mock 30 minute HBS interview. Great. Uh, so let's get into character. We'll do a half hour of the real thing. Uh, and then we'll debrief afterwards in terms of your answers and approach and everything like that. So first of all, this is going to be a wonderful opportunity. I'm so excited to be able to do this with you, John. There's so much misinformation out there. So I think it's great that we could do this and show people kind of, you know, dispel a few of the myths and that it's actually a very friendly interaction. <laughs> Indeed. So, okay, let's get into character. Hi, John. So nice to meet you today. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. Well, we're excited to have you. Let me spend a minute to tell you what to expect and the rest of the time is all for you. 30 minutes goes by super, super, super fast. Fastest 30 minutes you'll ever experience. There's a lot to cover. I may jump us around. I may even cut you off, redirect you. I might look at the clock. Please don't pay any attention to that. It's just my way of tracking. Um, my only goal is to get to know you. There are no right or wrong answers. You might say something brilliant and I don't write it down. It doesn't mean it wasn't brilliant. It's just kind of like my, my own way. Uh, thank you for all of your hard work on your application. This is really the fun part. It may not feel that way right now, but it really is. So with that said, shall we jump in? Absolutely. Okay, so you studied English and political science, and then you moved into, you know, business journalism. So how did, how did that transition work for you? Well, I think I was an English major because I always wanted to write. And initially, I wanted to be a political writer, as many young journalists want to be. You know, every journalist considers himself or herself a reformer at heart. And, you know, you basically want to uh, cover public policy and important issues that affect a lot of people. So that combination worked well for me to learn how to actually put words on a piece of paper that made sense mm -hmm. and to understand uh, what a democracy is, uh, how it works and how political officials sure. run our country. So then in terms of, uh, so you made that switch from, you know, political reporting into business reporting and seriously, like you kind of never really looked back and at, um, and at business week, you know, looking at kind of the first um, set of business school rankings, it was, you know, during your tenure there. So what was, you know, how did you make the case for business school rankings? Like, you know, did you go to your boss and say, you know what, I think we should rank business schools. I went to my boss with a, a really interesting proposal. Mm -hmm. The average age of a Business Week reader was 51 or 52 at the time. I said it's, it's uh, a key to our editorial strategy to attract a younger generation of readers. And to introduce the magazine and the brand to that generation, what better way than to offer some sort of advice to help them make an informed decision about where to pursue graduate management education. And so I sold the ranking as really an editorial strategy ploy to win a new generation of readers. Now, the other thing about that ranking was I didn't want to do what a traditional ranking would do, which is in other words, take already available public information and put them in a pot, stir them up and come out with some sort of completed uh, meal. Instead, I wanted it to be completely proprietary. And I felt like there were two customers of um, a business education. The students who uh, have uh, three to five years of work experience. So they're discerning customers and they're spending enough money uh, on this degree and this experience, particularly when you add in the opportunity costs 
that will allow an MBA education to essentially be the second largest expense in their life after a home. Mm -hmm. uh, this is serious business. And these are our future readers. And then the second part of the, uh, the customer base, if you will, uh, were the companies that hired the product of uh, the business schools. The employer. So I designed essentially a customer satisfaction survey that became a ranking. So basically in today's parlance, you created your own algorithm for these rankings. True. Um, and did you sell like what, me so besides readership or at that point it was print issues, right? That was probably the metric yes. of, uh, or, and, and advertising dollars and pages. No internet in 1988. <laughs> That's right. Um, and, you know, do, why weren't business schools part of that audience? Uh, they were part of the audience uh, because the demographic is much broader than how I defined it. Um, but at the time, we weren't really doing any management education coverage. Mm -hmm. This is a crucial area uh, where you have really the, the world's best and brightest going to these schools. And you wanted them to be introduced to the brand, even though the brand was a legacy brand and old and attracted a demographic that was much older. And so my focus was on serving that audience. Mm -hmm. It wasn't on attracting advertising because, you know, in editorial, we really don't care or think about it. We probably should have given what's happened to the media business. Um, but at the okay. time, believe me, advertisers were the last thing we ever thought about. And if anything, in those days, I think it's still true today. There's a journalistic ethic yep. where there's a, uh, a snide, and I'll call it snide because I think it's wrong, the satisfaction that journalists have when they run stories that lose advertisers for their employers. And I think that is snide, it's cynical and it's wrong, mm -hmm. but there exists out there that feeling. Of course. Yep. Well, so that um, so we have you to thank for you know kind of the um, the the MBA ecosystem as it is today. Um, it's a dubious distinction for sure. <laughs> that's right. Like in some ways, you have more influence than like AACSB, right? And like you're the ultimate influencer in today's parlance um, uh, in terms of business school education. So let's switch gears and talk about poets and quants. So you know you're at the perch of Business Week, uh, and and then you know what was that day like that you're like you know what. Poets and Quants is my next step. So uh, Business Week fell on hard times. In the year in which Business Week was sold to Bloomberg, mm -hmm. the magazine lost $65 million. Unbelievable. At the time I was executive editor of the magazine and editor in chief of our online operation. And I didn't want to work for Bloomberg and I had uh, just become um, married to a woman in California so I knew I needed to leave New York and go to California. And I thought, you know, if I'm ever gonna do something on my own, now is the time. Mm -hmm. And my original idea was to create a Huffington Post for business, mm -hmm. not a Poets and Quants. And the idea was to have a dozen or more sites that covered areas of business that were undercovered mm -hmm. uh, or poorly covered. And that these 12 sites would then roll into a master site that would be kind of the huffing post yep. Makes sense. And I uh, pitched to uh, VCs and I had uh, two partners, one from um, Fortune and one from Forbes. And then I was from Business Week. We were kind of like the super group, the Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young of uh, business journalism and trying to do this startup. Uh, it didn't quite work out that way because my colleagues weren't as entrepreneurial. They expected their salaries to remain intact. Uh, so I went off and I did this on my own. And my first site was Poets and Quants because I knew the area well. I knew I can get my arms around it. And even though it was an area that I had to cover for many years, I was familiar with it enough uh, that I thought I could add value. And so I launched Poets and Quants. So, so obviously you started off as a poet, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And now I'm, you know, you've had to probably, you know, uh, be methodical of how to get that quant. So now as a founder and as an entrepreneur, in what ways have you grown as the quant? I think that I've uh, learned how to actually run a successful business. Uh, I've learned the sacrifices that it requires. Uh, 
<clears throat> the compromises, um, the effort to work with uh, different people and work well with them uh, to recruit and retain a talent, um, to pay people fairly and to create, you know, a, a community. I kind of like to think of our employees as extended family. Uh, this has been much more difficult during the pandemic, of course, of where everyone's working on their own in, in different locations. Um, and I hope that when this pandemic ends, we'll be able to get the glue back together and more of us will be able to work uh, together more closely. So but it, 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 yeah, it's learning all those, okay, learning about everything from how do you set up payroll systems uh, to how do you collect um, on an invoice to how do you sell? What do you sell? Um, but there are a lot of different issues that, that you get your hands on. And for someone like me who had no true business training, I think an MBA uh, would greatly help me uh, run my business in a more professional way. Mm -hmm. So then why do you think you've been so successful so far? Uh, I identified a niche where there was an important market. I had basically proven that there was a market there at Business Week. Our online operation in the business school area uh, was the only area in Business Week online that had any real true community. The average user to uh, the Business Week site did no more than 1.8 page views a month, 1.8. And that's fairly typical, oddly. Uh, in our business school area, they did 52 page views a month. It was a huge success. Right. So out of all the things that you've accomplished at Poets and Quants, right, it really is the, um, you know, the, the must read for people in the MBA ecosystem from deans to uh, applicants. Um, what is the most meaningful accomplishment to date? In regards to Poets and Quants? Mm -hmm. I, th I think, you know, we are in our 12th year and we've never had uh, a crisis or a downturn. We've uh, virtually have always had increasing revenue, increasing profit. There have been uh, years when the traffic has gone a little bit down, or we've had a record year in traffic. Uh, but I, but I think the, to me, uh, the biggest success is the fact that we've been able to sustain uh, a business over 12 years now successfully to employ people and give them, you know, health benefits, 401k plans, um, be as generous as we possibly could, um, and do so in an environment that is friendly, that there is no pressure, uh, there is no hard edge to how the place is managed at all. It's managed, I think, fairly well, and we delegate a lot of responsibility. People who are in my employ have a lot of flexibility and freedom uh, to do their job. And I think that's probably it. So knowing what you know now, anything when you look back that you would have done differently? That's a really good question. And of course uh, there is. <laughs> uh, there are areas of coverage that I wish that we had um, pursued more aggressively. One area would be executive education. So, you know, we have five sites. One is an undergraduate site. One is a site for executive MBAs. One is the main MBA site that also covers specialty master's degrees, online MBAs and things like that. Um, but one area that I have always felt uh, would be incredibly lucrative would be coverage of executive education courses. And right now the market is going through something of an inflection point because those courses, which had long been in person are moving online. And that means that people can take them um, from anywhere in the world. They're far more accessible. So schools can actually enroll larger numbers of people, but you know, the competition is severe and, and people need guidance. Yeah. And they, they need the, the sort of context uh, through which to help make the right decision for them. And that means comparing and contrasting these programs, telling you how much they cost, how long they are, what it takes to get in them, 
what you'll actually learn, who's teaching them, how one is differentiated from another. It, the, uh, I was going to say that's probably a lot harder to classify, whereas the bus business school is a little bit more standard, especially the full-time program. That's true. That is true. But I wish that we had developed that and we already had it uh, instead, of, instead of now being uh, trying to develop this area because I think you know, it would have been a great area to develop because there's a need, a market need for this information and it's not, there's no competition for it. And um, executive education areas have their own marketing budgets. So yes. it wouldn't be like we'd be, we'd be uh, putting our hands in the marketing budgets of our existing clients. Yes. These are actually same school, but different client. Yes, and, not the profit center. <laughs> yeah, and, and these are lucrative, um, yes courses for the school. So therefore they have more marketing money than they would have in some of the other areas that we're already in. But, you know, hearing you speak, you are clearly a storyteller, right? Obviously the writing part of it. Uh, you like the, you know, the studying politics, the drama, the kind of, you know, the interworkings. But if you think of MBA as a product or ecosystem, why is that the, why was that the focus of, like you devoted your whole, you know, basically your career to this thing called the MBA. So what is it about the MBA world that has just fascinated you? There's, I, there is a personal story behind all this. Uh, I'm a first generation college graduate. Uh, higher education changed my life in every possible way. My parents were factory workers. Um, neither of them went to college and my mother didn't even get out of grammar school. She was illiterate. Uh, and going to school literally opened the doors for me and, and let me understand that there was a different world out there than the world that I had been in. And I really believe uh, that higher education is, is the surest way, not a guaranteed way, yep. Right. For social mobility. The least risky. But more importantly than social mobility, more important than income, is how it enriches your life mm -hmm. in ways that make life more meaningful. And what I'm talking about here is developing a curiosity mm -hmm. uh, for how things work, um, understanding the importance of, right, of course. cultures, geography, literature, art. The poet uh, line. Yeah. And you can't get that without a great college education. And, and that allows you to live life in a multi-dimensional way, not merely on the surface. And that is to me, the most important aspect of higher education. Now, why the MBA? Because I think of all the graduate degrees, and in fact, of all the undergraduate degrees, a business education is a no-brainer. Because unlike any other uh, college or department in the university, a business school teaches you not only about marketing, finance, accounting, and strategy. It's a professional development course. Mm -hmm. It sands off the rough age edges in individuals. It makes them uh, more effective as human beings. And more than that, uh, the secret sauce of every business school is a good school is devoted to not only handing you a diploma at the end of your coursework, it's devoted to making sure you get a job uh, that's a meaningful job. And there is no other college, no other department at the university that does that, that even cares about that. None, none, only a business school. And so if I want to encourage people to go for higher education, I also want to know that it's gonna pay off for them, that it's gonna be meaningful for them. And I really think that the MBA is probably the, the best deal you can have, particularly for a poet or a quan. Hey, if you if you have an engineering mind, if you're a if, if you think like a quant, fine, go for a science degree if that's gonna uh, float your boat. Computer science is great, but the return on an MBA is just a no-brainer investment. So based on what you said, who do you think is like which audience do you uh, are, do you have the most satisfaction in serving? So is it the deans? Is it the professors? Is it the applicant? Like what yeah. stories, you know, 
what success stories are exciting to you? Is it the school that goes from 100 to 50 to 10? Is it, uh, is it the, you know, the underdog applicant? Is it the employer that all of a sudden, you know, was it like, uh, you know, all these consulting firms are hiring the best of the best. So what, which of those stories make your heart sing? It's a story of a would-be applicant who's unsure about whether or not to make the investment and not knowing even where to go or how to start. And it's helping to guide that person to make the right choice. One that's, that's informed, one that will increase the odds of their success, uh, and, and one that really delivers on what schools often say, but may not really be true, um, to get that transformative experience is gonna change their life. Uh, so it's not even the applicant, it's the would-be applicant and convincing that person that this is the right move for them and it's going to really make a difference in their life. That is the person I think about all the time. So the would-be applicant there is really even, they, don't, they may not even know about poets and quants. That's true. And so it's my job to find them. Uh, you know, if you build it, they will come. That's not true. You have to go where they are and find them and invite them in. And so, that's been the strategy from day one. Even before we had a website, we were active in social media, all social media. Mm -hmm. I'm yep. active on Reddit, Quora, yep. uh, obviously uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, oh. Instagram, um, Pinterest. I mean, you name it. Yes, you, you name the platform, you're there. Um, so then if we, you know, if we think about, if we step back and say, you know, Poets and Quants is this business, right? Um, but then, as you said, what business are you in? Are you in the business of media? Are you in the business of business education? Are you in the business of admissions? Uh, or are you in the business of rankings? Like, how do I think about Poets and Quants just as a business? When I was in the magazine business, I felt that what a magazine really is, a good magazine, is a friend you invite into your house. Uh, an intelligent friend who you are eager to have a conversation about. Uh, and in the case of Business Week, it would be a conversation about the economy, what's yep. going on in the world of business. Uh, I like to think of that what we are doing is we are a friend to our audience to help deliver to them information that will be useful uh, to guide them through a process that's often anxiety ridden. Uh, that is a long process that requires a lot of determination and discipline uh, and to cheer them on. So I like to know, <laughs> you know, of course we're a digital media company, Absolutely. but I like to think of ourselves as friends to people who need guidance to make the right decisions for themselves. So then in terms of the rankings and, you know, I am a quant, um, although I think business school made me a poet. So, um, so, you know, I think you and I are probably on the opposite sides of the coin here. So, um, you know, I think about this from a quant perspective. So where would rankings be on, let's say a hypothetical business school's financial statement? Is it an intangible asset? on a balance sheet or is it more of like an expense on an income statement? So how, you know, let's say like uh, somebody's a new dean, they have to worry about rankings now. Um, uh, how do they think about it from a, from a financial perspective? I think of it as goodwill. You know, mm -hmm. you value exactly. it on the balance sheet. Uh, it's very hard to put a number on goodwill sure. uh, because it really rests on your reputation and your credibility in the marketplace. So to me, uh, rankings reflect a school's reputation and reflect a school's ability to deliver, uh, to attract quality students, to employ great faculty, and ultimately to get the students' jobs and to be accepted by uh, the hiring organizations uh, out there who literally make the market for the MBA. So I, I see it as a, as a um, goodwill calculation of one kind or another. Um, for some schools, rankings are relatively meaningless because a Harvard, a Stanford, a Wharton, um, it doesn't matter as much. It may actually matter more to MIT, Chicago Booth, Kellogg, Columbia, Dartmouth, and other schools like Michigan, Indiana, UVA. Um, and then it 
really accounts for a second tier school, a third tier school, which is largely struggling you know, in the full-time MBA market. But if that's the case, shouldn't, you know, like you said, in terms of access and everything. So here I am, a would be, um, I hear about this MBA, you know, my boss's boss might have the MBA. Shouldn't I just, you know, find a program where I feel like I belong? Shouldn't I find the program where maybe it's close by so I can really get to know the professors? You know, why would I have to pick up and move across the country? There are so many good programs. So at what point does rankings become, become meaningless for the school? I, I, th I think that uh, the, the benefit of rankings is uh, it's a first step in your journey. In other words, if you don't know a whole lot about graduate business education, uh, you might go to a ranking just to understand what the landscape is. So what does a Harvard or Stanford or Wharton expect of an applicant? What does an Indiana, a Vanderbilt, an Emory expect of an applicant? How does that differ? Uh, then when I know, okay, do I have even a chance to get in? What do I need to know about these programs, their strengths, their weaknesses, uh, who hires their students, uh, what the students themselves after they graduate think about the experience that they've just uh, had mm -hmm. uh, to help me determine whether or not I might think this is worth further exploration and whether they should be on my list, my consideration list. So that's what I think the rankings, rankings are not designed um, given how mindlessly put together they are and how flawed, how statistically meaningless they are. Um, they are not designed to help you decide, okay, I got into five and I got into eight. So therefore I'm going to five because it's ranked higher than eight. That would be a disaster. Although we do know that too many applicants take rankings too seriously. And one of the things that we do in the coverage of rankings is to immediately discount uh, their importance by pointing out their flaws, by pointing out how impossible it is for schools to be jumping up and down in double digit moves year over year when no other changes have really occurred. And they're totally- That's good drama. Yes. Well, that's, that's good eyeballs, right? That's that that that's good for you know advertising. That's good for media. So it's almost it's you're feeding the beast. Absolutely, and, and the beast needs to be fed. A a web a, a website based on content is a hungry gorilla needing bananas every day, <laughs> and and rankings are the ultimate meal uh, in our little world. So uh, people obsess over them. Uh, we're a society that obsesses over lists and rank Absolutely. We love them. It's even Darwin. When, it's even Darwin. When they're nonsensical. Yes. Um, and maybe the value is more uh, uh, for entertainment than it is for true information. But the beauty of a ranking is that you can parse it and it requires schools to hand over information that allows you to compare and contrast schools in ways you otherwise would not. I argue that while schools all have a love-hate relationship with rankings, rankings have been the best thing for business education ever. Here's why. I think the reason why the MBA is the most popular graduate degree in America is because it's ranked uh, so heavily. Now, you got law school, you really have one rank in US news. Med school, same thing. Any other school. But think about this. You have The Economist, you mm -hmm. have The Financial Times, you have Business Week, you have Forbes, and you have US News, major media brands reminding you every year how important this area is. And that mind share has contributed to the growth and the success of business education. Says the person who founded Created the Created the monster. <laughs> Um, so then if we think about what's next for poets and quants, so what if like Rupert Murdoch, Barry Diller call you up and say, you know what, uh, we want you to be our in-house entrepreneur. You clearly understand how to monetize content. We're having a little trouble here. Um, what would be interesting for you as kind of the next step? I love um, what I do and I love building on it. And our goal is to become, you know, 
bigger, employ more people, um, and influence and touch more lives. I have no interest in working for someone. I spent my entire life as a so-called organization man, um, which was the term in the 50s, um, given to those who worked for the man. Um, I don't want to work for the man or for the woman. <laughs> I want to work for myself. And uh, I get tremendous um, positive reinforcement by having created something on my own and um, continue to make it grow and work. And I just can't imagine doing something else. So with that said, then what are the types of things that you're really looking for uh, in terms of ways to improve your skill set or your leadership uh, at business school? Yeah, so I, I know little about uh, marketing. I know little about finance and accounting. Um, and what I have learned as a leader has been all self-learned. And I really think that I can up my game significantly by having the benefit of really smart faculty members and the benefit of great classmates mm -hmm. who have other experiences. Um, that can make my business more successful. Give you a good example. Uh, we are locked out of China. Well, if I went to business school and earned my MBA, I would be trying to understand how do we make, what is a global brand? 35% of our traffic is from outside the US, but how do we penetrate the market in China successfully? What do we need to do? How do we go about that? Uh, do we do it on our own? Do we do it with partners? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What will it cost? Um, what's the timeline on uh, making it happen? Uh, our largest outside audience is India, but I'm not convinced we're serving the Indian market as well as we could or as smartly as we could. I think that just going to get my MBA and, and learning how to think about these things in a more yep. disciplined way would be a tremendous benefit uh, to me and to and to all our colleagues at the company, because so perhaps I writing business plans for some of these ideas, uh, being able to prototype, you know, what that offering would look like. So then, as you think about HBS in particular, is there anything that gives you pause uh, about uh, attending HBS? Nothing. Uh, you know, I know a lot about HBS, um, having kind of studied the organization for so many years. I totally buy into the case study method of learning. Mm -hmm. um, I, I get that to me, an important part of a, a really good MBA program is the learning that you get from your classmates. Mm -hmm. And I think the classmates that I would have at Harvard would be second to none in the world, uh, which means that I think the learning I would receive and what I can contribute in that class uh, would be at the highest possible level. I want that full immersive experience. I want to feel the pressure of a cold call in a class. I want to know that I can measure up and add value to a complicated discussion. I mm -hmm. want to be able to tear apart a balance sheet in an income statement uh, in a way that allows the numbers to tell me what the true story is and mm -hmm. to lay it insight into what the right action might be. Understood. Um, so as we wrap up, uh, just a few more things. Um, recommend something. Well, I will recommend a, uh, a movie. How about that? Great. Uh, actually, it's a series. It's uh, a series about the opioid crisis and the role of a company uh, that is largely responsible for the opioid crisis is called Dope Sick. And if you haven't seen it, it is a very riveting, compelling tale. Uh, it's very revealing about how uh, corporate dynamics and corporate greed can lead to disastrous results. And, and I think it's a great window on unchecked Read, mm -hmm. um, where conscious conscience leaves the room, and bad decisions are made that hurt a lot of people, 
Sure. And it's made in such a way as to bring you front and center with the people who had to experience that awful turmoil, which our country is still living through. Um, no, I'll, I'll make a note to put that on my list. Uh, and then just, you know, we covered a lot of different things. Um, you know, a few, little bit of personal, a little bit of entrepreneurial, you know, and your journey. Is there anything else you want to make sure we cover today before we wrap up? I would say this, uh, you mentioned earlier, if, do I have any concerns about Harvard? And I, and I don't really, because I've met enough students to know that they defy the stereotype that's often made of them. Uh, but nonetheless, I know that I would be going to a school where there are a lot of people from very wealthy backgrounds who've had advantages that I never had. And I, and I wonder, uh, how will I mix with that? How does a first generation college graduate who came from humble circumstances, uh, who did not avail himself of Princeton, Yale, Harvard, Stanford, uh, who didn't work at McKinsey or Morgan Stanley, uh, how will I mix in that crowd and will they receive me with open arms? That is a very understandable concern. And uh, having been a student and in admissions, I can honestly say that that is probably a concern even um, regardless of background. And that is a stereotype. But I think once you're in the classroom, it is, you know, you just see name tags. You don't see their bio. You don't see their parents. You don't see their childhood. You see their ideas you see their drive, you see their effort um, and their comments. And I think that really does um, transcend kind of your, the path you had to take to get to HBS. Now, obviously on a one-on-one, -on -one, you'll get to know people and everything, but I understand your concern and there is room for everybody and for every path. That's reassuring. So on that note, that ends our time today. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to get to know you. It was my pleasure. And I'll say goodbye here and uh, you'll be notified about next steps. Well, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. So Debbie, how did I do? <laughs> well, first, before I give you my impressions, what did you think? Uh, I think the biggest conclusion is that I expected maybe to be tripped up. I expected some trick questions, but it was very natural and um, thought it went pretty well. Yes. Um, so in terms of, you know, a lot of this is about how you think, how you present information and how you can um, articulate your path. And through that, the interviewer can see a lot. Um, so in this case, because you knew your material so well, understandably. Um, uh, I didn't have to ask a lot of follow-up questions. And I think that is where some people can get tripped up of. They give like just short answers. So what I really valued is that you took a moment to tell me the context. Um, and a lot of people, there's, <laughs> there's this myth out there that you have to have everything in a minute or you have to give you know, two minute answers and that's just not true. So um, what I valued and it, then that's why I didn't have to ask so many follow-up questions is that you gave me the story. You gave me the answer. You know, there were times when I thought I was talking too much. And there, I were, went there, were, there were a few times and I didn't mind it because if I thought it was too extreme, I would have jumped in and cut you off. And there were times that I tried to yes. you know, expedite. Um, but at the same time, there's always a trade-off, right? In terms of uh, full answers. So I can see the full aspect of how your experience would translate um, into the HBS world. Um, and uh, so that's what I'm saying. That the way you structured your answers prevented five follow-ups. So yeah. it all it all works out, right? Like so that's what I mean by, and in the meantime, I'm you know, I'm thinking about, oh, well, if that's the case, I don't have to ask this other question that I was planning to ask because we already covered it. So that's right. the real time triangulation that I'm doing is, you know, I have like a roadmap <laughs> of, <laughs> of all the different things that we could cover and a full answer will preclude some other future question. Mm, true. The one area that I 
was hoping you would go into more detail was the quant side of your job. So that's why in terms of, you right. know, uh, you know, I, when I, when I said you're clearly started off as a poet and in which ways have you developed as a quant? And um, so there were no metrics in that answer, you know, it was, but the answer, the, the, you answered the question, how did you grow as a leader? And, and so it was, um, so, you, so you ended up answering a different question. Um, but I, and so that's why I, you know, went and asked a follow-up question in a completely different way of saying, you know, if rankings were on a financial statement, where would it be? And and so that's that's what I mean by like if you had answered that question, I wouldn't have asked the the follow up question later. Right, and that's important because you really need to address the question being asked, and you can't detour from it. You can't, um, but at the same time, there are in this case, um, you know, you also want to give the benefit of the doubt, right? Like in terms of hey, this person clearly just you know was thinking about it in a different way. I can go back and ask that question. If right. I ask that question in a different way and I still didn't get an answer, okay, then it's an then it's an, right. But so like if in this case, I I how I took or what I took away from it was that uh, he thought it was about leadership or whatever, fine. It's, you know, it's a nerve wracking moment. It is a human experience. It's not punitive, right? You can see this is not a punitive experience. Yeah, exactly. Now, I understand that there are a lot of people who come out of an interview and they think they completely bombed it or, cool. they, or they think they aced it and neither might be true. How right. is it people come out of this experience with uh, a point of view that's just not what the reality is. Because it's about judgment, right? You don't know where you fall. It's about every class discussion, right? <laughs> every class discussion, you might say a comment and, and I guarantee you afterwards, you're like, was that stupid or was that on the mark? <laughs> it's, the, it's the same thing. You're in meetings too and you, and, and you say what you feel or you say what you believe. So it's the same thing here. This is a microcosm of how you communicate at work. Um, and sometimes you hit it on the mark and sometimes you come close to it, right? So it's, um, uh, it is exactly that nebulous that makes people nervous. You know, um, thinking back to what you just said about the quant question and how I wasn't direct in answering it. And I really, and you're right. I should have said, the truth is, I haven't really developed much uh, as a quant. And one of the things I'm hoping to achieve by getting my MBA is to be more comfortable with numbers and what numbers say. And that would have been the ideal answer, frankly. Well, not the ideal, that could have been one good answer. The other, another good answer could have been, you know what, we look at these metrics, right? We look at page views. Um, that's really important to us. We look at- um, Sure. You know, yeah. Right. Like you could have, you could have listed a couple of different metrics too, in yeah. terms of all of that. Or, uh, you know, some companies manage to EBITDA, we manage to uh, contribution margin because, uh, you know, we have a lot of variable costs. We don't have a lot of fixed. You could have said a lot of different things, right? Like in terms of, of what, of how you manage the business. Right. That's very true. And uh, indeed we, uh, as a web business, we are very data focused. I mean, we're looking constantly by the hour mm -hmm. uh, at how the site is performing, what's doing well, what's not doing well, what needs to be promoted. Exactly right. If we see something that's okay, people now are accessing stories that are older about how to prepare for the Harvard Business School interview. Well, that means that we should basically make them more that's visible right. to people. We should promote them on social media. Um, even though there's there's stories that could be years old. Yeah, and, and I deliberately asked an open-ended question about quant because I wanted to see where you would take it, right? Is it quant, not just accounting or finance, but quant means different things in terms of metrics. It could be operational. It could be, um, you know, like I said, geographic, right? So it's more of what metrics do you use to, uh, to monitor and manage the business as well? True. So that was one where, but like I said, but that's why that's why the interviewer prepares for a whole host of questions because there are so many different conversational paths that could happen. So I had other questions prepared that I knew I, I had to throw in to be able to make sure that we talked about quant. Right. And this underlines the importance of listening and listening very hard uh, before mm -hmm. you open your mouth. 
<laughs> yes. Uh, I think one of the biggest problems is people, they practice so literally um, and they're hanging on to <laughs> that phrase or that uh, story that they're just waiting to tell. And even the closest question, they're going to they're gonna try to insert that um, as much as possible. But yes, you have to make sure you answer the question that's actually asked, as opposed to the question that you think <laughs> that they asked. Yes. Absolutely. So that was one. Um, then in terms of one of, I think the turning point in the conversation and something that I didn't expect was your personal story. Uh -huh. and, uh, and that was fantastic. Um, and people, that's what I mean by this is such a, yes, it's for business school and it's for numbers and it's for career and it's for impact and all of that, but it's also about the person um, and why you do what you do. So it took a while to get there in terms of like, you know, um, you know, we talked about business week first, and then we talked about on your uh, journey into entrepreneurship. But to me, when you started talking about the why for you, uh, it totally turned things around. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. And that is something that um, that's when it's the you're not talking to an applicant, you're talking to a human. Right. That personal story that creates connection. That's exactly right. Because then then I see why you are so um, focused on this, right, in terms of why this is because uh, when I was preparing, it's like, how does a political writer now become this influencer, right? I mean, again, using today's parlance, in a very structured, very um, traditional, cons fairly conservative um, world. Right, true. And so it was the, that was the nut that I was trying to crack. Hmm. And so, so you have to think about the interviewer also thinking of preparing for the interview as a case study. That's the part that I didn't get. Yeah, right. Um, so that's why, so then when you're talking about that, I just sat back and listened, mm -hmm. right? In terms of, so, because that is the story that unlocks everything else. Yeah. Yep. And so that's what I mean by, um, and I didn't have to interrupt. I didn't have to ask a follow-up question. You told me exactly what the, the, the missing part of why you're so motivated to do all of this. Yes, right. Uh, should I? No, that came up naturally. Uh, if I was thinking about this strategically, is that something that I should have come up immediately? Okay, right. No, because then it would have felt artificial, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. And and what if I? Um, what if it was something else that was the unlocking moment, right? In terms of it could have been a different part of that story. So I don't think you should artificially insert uh, um, a story because you think of like, you know, like that you have to, you have to be so compelled to tell something, it should come up naturally. And that's where it becomes a, a, um, a dance. You could have alluded to it of, you know, when you start, maybe you could have said it up front of the, you know, um, English to political science and that this was just a world that fascinated you. And then I would have, you know, maybe said, why does it fascinate you so much? But clearly, it fascinates you. What I'm saying is I already know that from studying your path. Right, yeah. Hmm. So like, it's pretty obvious in terms of you have dedicated your life to the MBA. Now, I did not prepare for this interview because I had no idea what you'd be asking anyway. But I wonder if you do prepare as most applicants would because this is a really big and important step in the process. Can you over-prepare? Yes. You prepare in a way that makes you come off as scripted, yes. uh, which could be the end of it all. <laughs> Absolutely. That is the kiss of death, um, being scripted. And uh, that's why you have to leave room for spontaneity. And honestly, I wish it wasn't called an interview. I wish it was called a dialogue or a conversation. And one of the first things that people say is like, wow, it was kind of natural or <laughs> wow, it really was a conversation an interview feels so forced. Um, and there are so many, um, whether it's jobs or other business school interviews that feel very one-sided, question, right. answer, question, answer. This does feel like a, um, uh, a dialogue. Um, a, a, and especially, you know, 
I didn't have to insert myself so much into it. I, I just wanted to hear what you had to say. Right. And through that, I can then go, you know, zigzag to other topics if I wanted to. So now when you file a report with the committee, um, what does that report look like? Do you actually grade the person you've interviewed on different aspects of the interview? From well, everything yeah. from professional presence to how articulate a person might be or thoughtful, or is it not that formal and systematic? I think each interviewer has their own way of communicating in terms of um, what's important and everything. There is there is that room for individualization. Mm, right. Um, because it, it's, it's hard to uh, box in, you know, 2000 interviews. Sure. <laughs> and I think by the time somebody gets to be an interviewer, you know, their judgment will have been vetted. Yeah, right. So there's a, there, so that's what I mean by there's a room for that interviewer to say what they need to say. So Debbie, are you, you going to release me or are you going to admit me? <laughs> You'll have to wait until decisions come out. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Just like all the other applicants. <laughs> no, seriously, I think this is um, super important to show the, the natural state of conversation. Um, I hope it also dispelled the myth of like that the interviewer has a poker face. <laughs> <laughs> That is, that is also a myth, I think, that has been started in the last couple of years because I'd never heard that before. Um, and you can see in terms of, right, there's a lot of notes. There's a lot of, you know, um, real-time calibration. Does the candidate have an advantage if uh, he or she does the interview in the morning instead of you know, late in the afternoon? No, not at all. I think it's a matter of um, you pick, uh, sometimes you don't have a choice, right? In terms of by the time you log in and you take what you can get. I think those are, if, I think <laughs> once the adrenaline kicks in, I think it is, uh, it'll compensate for any, you know, chore, any habit you may have of, you know, or, or preference of morning or afternoon. People say, oh my God, am I at a disadvantage for, uh, I'm on the first day. Am I at a disadvantage for the last day? Everybody thinks they will be at a disadvantage for something. I'm and only thinking about, I'm only thinking about the receiving it. It's, it's like they tell you, you know, if you're going to go in for surgery, you want to go in first thing in the morning because you don't want the surgeon to have done three or four or five of these by the time uh, he gets or she gets to you, uh, might be a little tired, a little, uh, you know, less focused. Uh, so I'm thinking from your standpoint, mm -hmm. I want to go first because then you're fresh and you're not tired and bored. And after 10 of these at the end of the day, do I want to be number 10 or nine or 11 after you've been through these and you just want to get home and finish? So I will tell you what went through my mind when I was at, when I was at HBS doing the interviews. I would get so nervous before each one. I would, um, you know, it's like you clear your head, you, ha you have to be so mentally disciplined to clear out everything else. There could be a fire like somewhere on campus and you just have to focus uh, because there's so much at stake for the person and the interviewer knows that a life is in the balance. Yeah. Like, so it is, you have to assume that by the time you're an interviewer, you know the stakes, you know what is um, happening here and it, is my job to bring my best uh, to the interviewee because I know that they have, and I know this means so much to them. And whether they get in or not, they need to feel that they were given a fair shot to do their best. Yeah. And that goes through every single uh, interview. Yeah. Hands down. And so I can even, say that about my colleagues. My even you colleagues. felt pressure. Yeah, even you felt pressure. Even you felt some level of huge anxiety even yeah oh yeah i would get um you know like like um little pain would shoot through my arms because it's a matter of like i have to, it's like cracking a case but in this case it's a person's life 
And right. so what is this, what is this person about? I have a half hour. I have to get the most out of it, right? In terms of, and that's why I say up front of like, I might cut you off. I might redirect you. You can't take any of that personally because I have to do my job. Right. This is also a professional experience. This is a professional situation for me. Right. This is a job. Right. This is not just a chit chat. Yes, it comes across very natural, but there's a reason it comes natural because I've done my homework. Exactly. Right. Um, and so that it's it's the it's the sign that I did my homework that you can feel relaxed in it. Great. Do you know what I mean? So that's why it's a completely different way of interviewing people because the burden is on the interviewer than mm -hmm. traditional other um, types of interviews where the interviewer just has the resume and shows up and the burden is on the interviewee. Right. So it's a completely different way of looking at an interview, at a candidate, at, um, um, at somebody's you know, kind of profile. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I think the interviewer knows exactly what's at stake. So that's why I think it's a wash when people say, oh, should I, um, you know, they're not going to be fresh. Well, six of one, half a dozen of another, and these are professionals, right? <laughs> right. True. So you have to assume that they know what they're doing and they're going to give you the very best of their attention. Now, imagining that, uh, because of human nature, there are differences among the different interviewers uh, by approach, by attitude, by vibe. Um, so that it's not like every applicant is having the same experience. Mm -hmm. Yes and no, in terms of it's a finite set of things to talk about, right? So it's your application. It is everything in your application is fair game. So that's what I mean by finite of there's going to be certain things and there's going to be certain things that you're going to cover of in in the half hour probably what you want to do post right um you know some formative experiences um that made you who you are maybe yeah. some personal stories so there are some fixed things fixed as in you know fixed areas that um, that are most likely to be covered. The exact how the question is worded or, you know, which angle they ask, that's up to the individual. But at the same time, you know, I think the, the broader admissions board, they also know the style of each interviewer. So that's what I mean by there's gonna, that becomes a wash as well. Right, yeah. And so they know, you know, so that's what I'm saying. After a while, all of that becomes noise. Your job is to just present you. And you can't worry about the noise. That's really true. So what's your, your bottom line piece of advice for people who are going to walk into a Zoom session and be interviewed by someone like you? <laughs> um, uh, think of it as you're talking to an executive at your company. Think mm -hmm. of it as you're talking to a dean at a business school, right? It's conversational, it's high level. Um, it's the, uh, and think about the takeaways, right? You embedded the learnings in some of your answers, right? At, at this point, it's not just the what happened, right? I often think of like your resume and your application. If you think about going back to like a movie or whatever, it's the plot. I went to college here. This is where I did my first job. This is, you know, that I moved on to this job. It's the, um, the progression, but in, in, um, and I think especially in an HBS interview, it's about the character development. Like, why did you take that job? Why, what did you take away from this project? You worked on the largest M&A transaction. So tell me how you grew from that, right? That's the part that becomes interesting. And that's the part that you should spend some time thinking about, right? It's not just the what. I know the what, right? In terms of the interviewer knows exactly what you've done, but may not know all the whys or the hows. And that's the, that's the part that you should be able to articulate. It was your life. You should know that, right? It's, it's a little kind of obvious that you should know that. True. Yeah. Well, that's really good advice, Debbie. It's hard to get to, but, uh, but that's where the fun begins. And, and I still remember when I used to say, you know, this is the fun part. And in the beginning of the interview, <laughs> their eyes would bug out and be like, how could this be fun? And then by the end of it, they're like, wow, actually that was kind of fun. So you also see how, how they kind of settle into their chair. They're, you know, much more at ease. And they're like, oh, this is, this isn't, and this isn't an interrogation, like what, you know, what you read uh, and everything. And so the point of today is to 
hopefully help people see that this is a much more natural exchange, um, that there aren't gotcha questions. I often say that if you think it's a gotcha question, you probably haven't practiced. Right. But that's, but that's not the intent. All good guidance and help. Well, I know, Debbie, that you have a calendar full of people who you will be helping to prepare uh, for their interviews at Harvard. Um, I'm sure that's fun for you too. It's super fun. It is one of the most rewarding parts of my life. Because uh, having met a lot of uh, MBA students all over the world at all kinds of schools, uh, I'm always amazed at uh, how eclectic, how thoughtful uh, they are and how, frankly, these are people you want to invite to your dining room table in your home. Yeah, some of these life stories are amazing, absolutely amazing. And some of the, and what you said in terms of the dreams that they have and that they see that the MBA is a means to that, it is so rewarding to be, to be a little part of somebody's journey, right? And, and I know I hit pay dirt when I can just sit back and just listen to them. Right. Right. In terms of that is when, and then they just tell me who they are. Right. That is the, that is when it, you're humming. Right. Now everyone out there, Debbie and I have done other uh, videos that you should look up before you walk into the interview. And uh, I want to thank Debbie for uh, not grilling me, but having the conversation <laughs> with me um, that, made me feel comfortable and relaxed and uh, allowed me to be myself, which I think is uh, really the most important thing uh, to do when you, when you do a uh, admissions interview at any school. It's always a pleasure, John, and uh, many more in the future. All right. Well, have thanks. a wonderful day. And for all of you out there, thanks for watching. This is John Byrne with Poets of Quants.